you guys to give a big round of applause for one of the two people responsible for bringing this beautiful madness into our lives, James Bryan. Thank you. That was really fun. I had a fun time watching that with you. I like seeing your reactions, actually. As I we're was remembering it. it all. It came back to me. <laughs> Good. Um, so obviously you guys were working with very small budget, very limited resources, but you're built, able to pull off a lot to what was going into the movie. And in particular, there's a really impressive car flip that happens yeah. in this movie. Yeah. And I think that has some interesting history to it. Maybe you should tell us about that. Maybe you were referring to the uh, car that flipped that belonged to Renee Harmon's husband. I think I am referring to that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> She didn't tell him it would be flipped. <laughs> How did she pull that And off? she didn't tell me he wanted the car back. <laughs> so, uh, but it was drivable. <laughs> so he got it back so he could uh, commute to work. <laughs> but the, the whole top of it was pushed I know, in. I don't know. I, he never discussed that with me. <laughs> um, so... I think everybody would probably like to know, um, what was your creative partnership like with Renee? Well, let's see. I, I thought my job was mm -hmm. to keep the film moving. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that was my contribution. So uh, a lot of the times we didn't know if we could complete a shot or how far the shot would go or whether things would work or not. So, But we had given ourselves two minutes, three minutes, mm -hmm. 100 feet of film, and we would try it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it worked great, and sometimes not so great. It but still we worked kept great going. all the time. We just could not stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and Renee, I don't know if a lot of people know, but the way that she would fund these movies is that she had an acting class, like a public, yes. like a local college class, so she taught people how to do this. Yeah. And so, in order to make the movie, she would tell people, you can pay me to be in my movies and you'll learn a whole lot. And that's the way the movie would yes. get funded. So everybody was uh, basically financing their scene. Right. So they would have a reel to play for casting, for auditions. Mm -hmm. And that's how she sold, you know, her students. And it worked. I, how smart is that? Like, I to know. do that. And she, it's not like she was... You know, like doing a wrong, doing people wrong. She was like, they were getting it to be in movies. Yes. They were actually released. Yeah. It's and, amazing. And we did finish. That was the thing. Yeah. Okay, we have ten minutes. We have to finish no matter what because we have to do another ten minutes and another and right. another. And, and that was the way for most people that you don't recognize. But let's talk about Trace Carradine, the elusive Carradine brother that somehow ended up in Lady Street Fighter. How did that come about? Well. That was not exactly an honest venture. What? <laughs> <laughs> because when the film was finished and uh, the distributors were looking at it and saying, well, we would like to distribute the movie, but I don't think there are enough names, name actors in the film. So I said, well, thinking as fast as I could on the phone, that uh, there was a Carradine brother. He didn't want to use his name, but. <laughs> if we use his name, maybe it'll be all right. So we made up a Carradine brother to be in the film. <laughs> it's amazing you got away with it. We got away with it, yeah. <laughs> well, the distributors really didn't mind if it was a lie, as long as they weren't part of it. <laughs> so. And then, speaking of the actors, Joel McRae, who plays Rick Pollard, Right. Uh, in the movie. Um, <laughs> when we were recording the commentary track for the Blu-ray, this really interesting story about him came up, and I think people would love to hear it, about his, his bender that he went on during filming, and then you know was, what happened after that. Yeah, the first weekend we shot, he uh, went off and had a great druggy weekend, and uh, he did a little too much, and he sort of lost control, and was threatening people at a motel, <laughs> wow. and... and you know, the police came and got him and they put him in, in uh, Camarillo so that, wow. uh, you know, and he was under observation for quite a while. I, I called and talked to one of the doctors and tried to convince him, but he didn't care. Wow. But eventually, he did get out early, though, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> under a condition that his mother would be with him 
the whole time. <laughs> so why we were shooting like the love scenes and things like that. His mother, who was a famous actress of her own, uh, was like within arm's reach of him, just out of camera range. We would start shooting and we'd close the closet door and she would be in, you know, right at the door ready to jump out and save him from drugs. <laughs> So we finished the film, and uh, the actress's name was Frances D, and she was uh, big in low-budget films in the late 30s and early 40s. And uh, she said that she had worked on a lot of low-budget films, but she had never seen one as low-budget as our production. <laughs> I took that as a compliment. <laughs> And I, um, you know, with working with Renee, what what was it like beyond your creative partnership? But when she would sit down to make this movie, because the movie is kind of like this amazing collage of just madness that just keeps happening. And how how was it put together? Um, like, did you work on that with her? Did she write it on her own? She wrote it on her own. She did. I mean, she would just get down and work and work, and she would type up ideas mm -hmm. and cut out lines and paste them around the room and then paste them on the page, and that's how she created it. Wow. And so once she had a scene, or a part of a scene, she would write something to connect those elements. So she was very good at it. And you guys went on to have quite a partnership. Oh yes. Decades together. Right. That, that's amazing, I, that's very heartwarming to me because a lot of the time you hear about people working, especially at this time in the 70s and 80s with exploitation, like people like kicking each other over left and right and bad things happening, but you guys stuck together and made some amazing work. Well, it was kind of rough sometimes, but I'm yes, sure. we did stick together. Yeah, um, Yeah. so um, I'd like to open it up to you guys for questions to Jim. Um, and remember, we do reserve the right to veto your questions, so good <laughs> questions only. Um, but does anybody have any questions for Jim at all? Right there. Whose idea was the um, champagne imagery? <laughs> the, cham the champagne orgy, you mean? Uh, no, well, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, in, in shooting the scene, it was shot at, at several different times to make it uh, a scene. So we had a location and we were limited about how long we would be in the location. So we shot as much as we could, and somebody opened the champagne and started pouring it on, on the different women around the set. <laughs> so that was our idea. So we did, <laughs> then we shot lots of champagne everywhere. <laughs> at, at later times, some of the film was actually finished in Salt Lake City many years after we started it, but it worked, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Did you go to a lot of toga parties in L.A.? <laughs> <laughs> no, I heard about toga parties in L.A. And actually, amazingly enough, I, I met, uh, let's see, like 50 years later, I met some guy in Lufkin, Texas, who had actually been to the toga parties of Southern California. Really? Wow. Yeah, and I'd only heard about it. I didn't know where they were, but he was there. And he told me all about it. So it was like, you know, they had horses and, and chariots Why did they and horses? they would you know they would meet you down at the hill and you park your car and then the the chariot would take you up to the house where they were having the toga party but yeah there was there was one guy who liked the idea of toga parties and that's what he would do Man, the world has gone downhill I know. <laughs> Man. Um, any other questions for jim anything right there can you talk about how the sequel Good, a great question. Uh, the sequel, yes. Well, we, uh, let's see, during this uh, time uh, that videotape sort of became predominant in the film business, uh, a lot of people were showing their videotapes and having them be successful. And so they decided that uh, what the uh, videotape renters wanted was another film just like the one everybody liked. So they started using uh, the footage that was shot. They would shoot 20 extra minutes and create a new story. And so you would have a sequel. And that's what we thought we would do. <coughs> create a really low budget sequel. So there were three of them. 
We did three different sequels. <laughs> and so Revenge of Lady Street Fighter was, and I mean, I've been a fan for this movie for a long time, and always I would see the end of Lady Street Fighter and go, where is that sequel? Like, why didn't it happen? It said this fall, and it never mm -hmm. happened. Um, but then we were hanging out at, at your house um, around the time we were doing Jungle Trap, and then there was a, a, another plastic bin over there that said, Revenge of Lady Street Fighter, 35 millimeter negative. Right. And we, so we found it, and you know what? You can get this Blu-ray and the sequel is on there for the first time ever you can watch the sequel to Lady Street Fighter. Yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, we, we created a niece who was also a Street Fighter. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions at all for Jim? Right there. Did you get the idea for the, uh, the theme from the good and bad and the ugly? Now, you, are you talking about the music yeah, or? Music. Uh, oh, yeah, music. The music came from, uh, uh, let's see, somebody that I was working with, uh, you know, where they're, they're running around in the alley and the police are chasing them. That was the scene of uh, a sound company called Scott Sound. And there was a, a editing studio there. And that's where we were. Anyway, uh, one of the people who was working there was a man named Bill Rabain, and he had shot a, a science fiction film in Wisconsin, and he found somebody at the University of Wisconsin to create this electronic music for smoke that comes out of the, the North Woods and threatens people, mm -hmm. sort of an evil force. And that's the music that we use because I had a lot of uh, rock and roll music, sort of original music, and he needed rock and roll for some film he was doing. And he asked me, and I said, sure, I'll trade you your science fiction music, which uh, sounded a little bit like The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and I liked it. So that I used it for this film, because there it was, I wanted to use it. I love the idea that Bill Rabane, who directed The Giant Spider Invasion, and James Bryan, who directed Don't Go in the Woods, were hanging out and did a vinyl swap. <laughs> and uh, that's how the music came about in your movie. Yes, it like, was. How it, amazing is that? So in that little editing studio, I also did the sound effects mm -hmm. for The Giant Spider Invasion. You because, did? Because I worked for the distributor oh, who yeah. was releasing it. You did a lot of sound, sound work. I did a lot of sound yeah. work, yeah. Um, is there, we have time for one more question, if anybody else has a question, right there. Uh, why celery, first off? And also, <laughs> what was the deal with the uh, five-year-old girl? Was that kind of like, uh, I don't know, kind of, uh, kind of some sort of analogy, but yeah. Uh, let's see, this was, let's see, the celery was what uh, was available from, <laughs> from catering. <laughs> <laughs> to shoot, he said, well, what do we use? What do we use? He said, here's a celery punch. Shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> and the little girl was um, sort of a brainchild of, uh, of a PR guy who was on the set and was helping out. And the actress who played the victim in Jaws, who, the swimmer, wanted to get another picture just for getting her name in the trades. And so for about a week, she played that part. And so the little girl part was created for her. And then of course she left and somebody else played it. And so it kept evolving. But yeah, for a moment, she was in the film. Oh, wow. That's insane. Oh. Wow, just like the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it changed quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I can't thank you enough for being with you. I know you took a lot for you to get here to travel and be with us here tonight. And we're so honored to have you and so honored that you are all here to enjoy this movie. And thank you for uh, you know elevating Renee Harmi Harmon's legacy with us tonight because that's really important to us. And when we sat down a year ago and said we wanted to put out Lady Street Fighter, the goal was to make sure that Renee Harmon is recognized for being a, a woman making exploitation films when it, it wasn't a thing back yeah. then. And um, I feel like we're doing it. Re and, uh, Renee Harmon has always amazed me with what she could do, mm -hmm. the power behind that, you know, thought of hers was just amazing. And she could not be stopped. And I always admired that. I admire that, that you just said that. <laughs> um, so we will have some Blu-rays for sale outside. We have a table right outside the door. And if you'd like Jim to sign them, be happy to do that. 
Um, but again, thank you so much. And thank you, you guys for being here. This was such a wonderful night. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Okay.